Good evening, everyone. My name is Jane Lamison, and I'm a Napa County Master Gardener. And mm -hmm. I'd like to thank you for joining us this evening for our July library talk. It's called What's Bugging You in Your Garden? And we bring you the Master Gardener Library Talks the first Thursday of the month um, in partnership with our Napa County Library. And uh, Stefana Pramick is our partner this evening, and she's going to tell us a little bit about what's going on at the Napa County Library. Stefana? Thank you, Jane. Um, I have a couple of recommendations today, and one is the uh, Practical Encyclopedia of Garden Pests and Diseases, and it's by Andrew Mikulowski. And it's an illustrated guide to common problems and how to deal with them successfully. You can learn how to manage the health of your garden and introduce natural predators and beneficial insects into the garden. 800 pests, diseases, and physiological problems are clearly described with more than 925 photographs. So they will help you identify common garden ailments. The only criticism I have is this is uh, the print is really tiny. So if you're like me and you need visual magnification, as long as you have your readers or a magnifying glass, this book is based with useful information for the home gardener. And we also have Good Garden Bugs by Mary M. Gardner, PhD. And it's a helpful resource to help you identify the insect in your garden. It emphasizes beneficial predatory insects in the landscape. And so if you're a gardener looking to improve your pest management and the ecology of your garden, then this is a useful tool for you. So I would, I would recommend it. Okay, back to what's bugging you in Thanks. your garden. Thank you, Stefana. Again, just want to remind everyone to mute yourself, please, and turn off your videos. Um, we have a few more housekeeping items before we um, get on to our topic. And um, whoops, one is the um, talk a little bit about the UC Master Gardeners, who we are and what we do. Uh, we are volunteers. Um, we're trained and certified by the University of California, and we are non-paid educators. And we're offering the latest uh, based uh, research-based information from the UC um, based on home horticulture, integrated pest management, water conservation sustainable landscaping. And um, you can find us throughout the community in various places, for example, through the Napa County Library, Fuller Park Rose Garden, Fuller Park Tree Walks, the Las Flores Learning Garden, Farmer's Market, Olay Health, the Help Desk, which we'll be talking about tonight, and our monthly work uh, workshops such as Food Forum. And you can also find us in the newspaper on um, the Napa Register. Another item, well, we sent a survey. Uh, we and the UC want to understand and determine if our programs are hitting the mark. Um, we, uh, we want to determine if we're impacting how you have changed, possibly changed your gardening techniques. Um, have you changed your habits based on some of our workshops and talks? So we send that survey to our participants and it normally comes out about a month or so after you have participated in a workshop. If you don't want to receive that survey, we hope you will respond because we do benefit from what you share with us. But if you don't want to receive that, please place your name in the chat box right now and we'll be happy to remove your name from that, uh, from that survey list. And one other thing, uh, we will be answering questions at the end of the presentation, but if you have questions that come up uh, while we're speaking, please put them in the chat box and we will, um, cover those at the end of the talk. Okay, let's get going. Um, our top topic tonight is what's bugging you in your garden. And we're going to start by just talking about what it's like to enjoy your garden. Um, we have a beautiful um, environment here in the Napa Valley. And in the mornings in particular, I don't know about you, but I enjoy going out to the garden with a cup of coffee um, and exploring what's going on in my garden. And in the summer evening, it's great to sit back and enjoy the work that you've done in your garden and bow your bounty. But sometimes while you're looking around at your garden, you notice some critters or some 
odd things. Some strange critters on your leaves, or maybe you're noticing yellow or injured or dead leaves on your plants, such as what's going on here on my gardenia. And so that's what we're gonna be talking about tonight. We're gonna to be talking about, whoops, getting to know your garden, diagnosing plant problems, biotic, which um, items that are, we're gonna be talking about good bugs and bad bugs under that topic. And we're also going to talk about abiotics, some seasonal issues you might see and integrated pest management. Sorry, my cursor, I mean, my advance is very jittery this evening. So it's important to spend time in your garden and observing. That's one of the things we're gonna mention several times tonight. Um, and it's not just enjoy what's the beauty that you've created in your garden, but to really get to know your plants um, and the inhabitants within your garden. What's going on in the space where you're gardening? And knowing the plants and what's going on in your garden is going to help you make an educated guess when you start noticing various problems or things that might be bugging you. Is it normal or abnormal? And I say educated because even well-trained horticulturalists, professional gardeners, and master gardeners can sometimes jump to a conclusion um, and be confused about plant problems if they don't know everything that's going on. Maybe they're missing some key items needed for diagnosing. So we recommend you're curious. Know the plants in your garden. Spend time um, in trying to make sure you know what the plant's all about. Is it a perennial? Is it an annual? Is it a California native? Is it tropical? And knowing the preferred environment of each of those plants is going to help you improve your success as a gardener and also the success for that plant. Are any of the plants in your garden prone to specific diseases? What do you know about your soil? Is it clay? Is it sandy? Is it loamy? And what about the sunlight in your garden? Do you have full sun? What time of the day are your plants in full sun? And what time of the day do your plants get into the shadow? Maybe a building or a fence or a tree starts to cause a shadow on a plant. Are you in a wind prone area? In my garden at about four in the afternoon, the wind pricks up and it stays kind of strong until about seven in the evening and then it settles down. Are you in a wind prone area? What about anything else going on in your neighborhood? Is there any building going on? Is there excavation, new development? Have you noticed extra dust? Let's say that while you're enjoying your garden, you start to notice certain things going on. It's time to diagnose what's really causing some issues in your plant, what's really bugging you. And so we recommend you put on your detective hat and start really looking at some physical evidence. Start with um, examining the plant as a whole and start to inventory some of the, the, the symptoms you're seeing. We recommend that you're pretty thorough. If you don't, do you know the plant that you're looking at that is having the problem? If you don't know your plant, take a photo of it and email it and send it to the Napa County Master Gardener Help Desk. Or you can bring a sample down to the Help Desk at the UCC office at 1710 Sosco Avenue or take it to a local nursery and they'll help you figure out what plant that is. Um, knowing your plant is really important and that's because you wanna know the species, the cultivar, and you wanna understand what its required environments are. What's its original um, environment and its growth patterns. And, and what may appear to be a problem could actually be normal for that particular plant. There are some apps that can help you identify um, what plant you might be looking at, but I caution you to be um, a little um, questionable about that because I've seen some of the apps misidentify plant based on how the photo or what the photo was like that was submitted. But the important thing about knowing your plant is without knowing what the correct plant is, you can't be sure what's normal or abnormal for that particular plant. So look at the whole plant. Is it at the normal size that it's supposed to be? Can you describe what the issue is? Are you seeing yellow leaves? Are you seeing brown leaves or injured? 
where is the brown? Is it the tip? Is it around the margins? Is the plant or the whole leaf distorted? Are there holes in the leaves? And if so, where am I finding those holes? <clears throat> is it in the middle of the leaf? Or maybe it's on the margins of the leaf. How old is that plant? Did you just buy it? Did a friend give it to you? So by taking a look at the whole issue, is the entire plant affected? Is it the trunk, the branches, the stems? Do you know if the new growth is being affected or is it the old growth that's being affected? Asking these questions as you view the plant is gonna help you pinpoint what some of the issues might be and possible scenarios that could be causing that plant. Are there signs of insects? If so, is the insect in its larval stage, let's say a caterpillar? Are there many insects? Is it an infant station? Or are you just seeing a few insects here and there that really aren't going to cause a problem with the health of that plant? So inspect the plant's environment. What if anything has changed and when did it start? Was it something that came on quickly or is it something that's happening over a period of time? Now I'm gonna turn it over to Lori. I'm sorry, it took me a moment to find my unmute. Well, hello. Well, I'm gonna to talk to you about biotic issues. And those are the issues that are caused by living organisms, such as a fungus, or um, maybe an insect, good or bad insect, or a bacterial virus. So here, as Jane had mentioned to you about looking in your garden, really hone your, your observation skills. And this is what's fun here. Now, this, this slide here is showing you some incredible experts at camouflage. At the top left there, you'll see this brown moth that just blends right into the leaves. And on the top right is a leaf insect. Now, we don't have these here, or at least be very hard to detect them. They're more in tropical areas, but it's amazing how insects actually can morph into something where they just disappear into their background for protection. And on the bottom left, we have katydids. Now, we do get these, and sometimes you might mistake it for a leaf. It looks very much like one. And on the bottom right is kind of a childhood favorite, right? Walking sticks. They are so strange looking, but wonderful. So next. So these things um, can conceal themselves through various ways. Sorry. Yeah? Whoops. Wait, go back, go to the next one, Jane. I, I already covered that one, I'm sorry. Oops. I think we skipped a slide, just keep going. That, that's just examples of the living organism um, biotic conditions. On the left, we have a powdery mildew, which you probably will see on some of your plants. This is quite common here. And in the middle um, are an invasion of the aphids, uh, very creepy crawly things there. And on the far right is a virus in, um, excuse me, a bacterial virus on an orchid leaf. So these are the kinds of things you want to look at when you're looking at your plants. Go ahead, Jane and keep going. All right, now, hold on. Look at these guys. Who is menacing and who is friendly? Now, the guy on the left looks pretty scary, doesn't he? He's got, he's awfully big and he's awfully shiny and he's staring right, right at us. The guy in the middle, pretty darn cute. Look at that little green face and those little antenna. He's really cute. And then the one on the right, oh my goodness, I don't know. He looks like he's got armor on. So let's go to the next slide and see who these guys are. On the left is a very good guy. This is a Jerusalem cricket. Another common term is potato bug. They are very scary looking. If you come across this in your garden, you're probably gonna scream, I did. And they're very big. They're a good couple, two, three inches long. They're, don't step on them, very crunchy, but you want him to, to be in your garden because he breaks down, decompo he decomposes matter that he finds, which helps turn your soil into something even richer. The guy in the middle, which we thought was cute, is not cute. That is an aphid. And you can see how they cover the stems of plants and suck the life out of them. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about aphids. But on the far right 
If you look closely at the face, he may be a little scary, but that is our beloved lady beetle or ladybug. And I want you to pay particular attention to the larva or its little uh, larva stage. Be sure that you protect those guys because that little black and orange creature there is gonna turn into a beautiful ladybug. So next. Now, of course we have lots of bees and they're all good, okay? There's 1,600 bee species in California, and a lot of them are native bees. And then, of course, we have the honeybee, which is actually a European import. So I encourage you, uh, and we'll talk about this, do not use sprays, um, any kind of pesticides, anything like that around these guys at all. We want to keep our bee population growing and thriving. They help provide over a third of our food. So it's important that we live with our bees. Next. Now, I thought I'd give you a quick glimpse of some of the common, common butterflies in Napa County. Um, the monarch, of course, we don't see as much as we'd like to. Uh, we know they're endang endangered and we're all trying to grow milkweed now. Um, you have to be careful. You got the right kind of milkweed, not a tropical milkweed. And those monarchs would love to kind of lay their eggs there and their caterpillars will um, live off the leaves and turn into beautiful monarchs. Um, in the middle, we have that swallowtail, which is gorgeous. And you'll see that flitting through your garden. I, I see those about every day in mine. Um, and then on the far right on the pipevine swallowtail. Now, what is very important here is to be able to identify their larva, which is their caterpillars. And there's a picture there of each one of those. You, is, this is what's tricky because some caterpillars are not good. They're gonna um, eat a lot of things you don't want them to eat. And we're gonna talk about a little bit about that, but you wanna identify the good ones like these and put up a, with a few holes that are gonna eat your leaves because that's how they're gonna survive and turn into butterflies. Let's look at the next slide. And here is another common one, gall fritillary. They're beautiful butterflies. And you can see again, his larva or caterpillar stage down there in the bottom. He's got an orange and black stripe on him. Okay, next. And we have a couple more, the morning cloak and the sulfur. Again, check out the caterpillars. Now let's go to one more. The destructive caterpillars. Okay. Now, as I mentioned, all of them are gonna eat a little bit of your foliage, and, uh, but you might wanna wait to see how much damage is done before you really take action. If you start seeing major damage like this, the leaf is totally skeletonizing, you've got webs all over, you've got this caterpillar chewing everything up, then I suggest you go out with a gloved hand and pick them off, off your plant and drop them into soapy water and that will do away with them. And I say gloved hand because some of them can sting. You don't want to do that. Um, another option is you can spray them with BT, which is an insecticidal, um, bec is called bec bec if I could pronounce this right, Bacillus thuringiensis. And it's a bacterium that you can buy from your local garden center. It is non-toxic to human pets, bees, beneficial insects and other wildlife. But again, it kills all caterpillars. So you must know who you are targeting it at before you spray it. And next. All right, now here's some of our really good guys and I'm sure you might recognize some of them. Of course, the lady beetle in the top left, our childhood friend is extremely helpful in the garden. You're gonna see them in various colorations sometimes. You're gonna see them some with a lot of spots, some with no spots. Um, they come in a variety of colors like red, orange, yellow, and brown. And they have a huge appetite for aphids, <clears throat> which we don't want. And they will also feed on thrips, moths, beetles, and mites. Again, things we don't want in our garden. In the top center is a surfid fly. Now he looks like a bee, but you can tell the difference because he only has two wings instead of four wings like a bee. Then another name for him is a mimic hoverfly. 
And um, they are, their larvae are excellent predators of aphids. And you'll find them on stems and rosebuds and that thing. And you know, all your plants, and they'll be cleaning off those aphids for you. Now on the top right is a very gory picture, but I couldn't resist. This is a parasitoid wasp. And we are looking at him here, um, implanting his egg inside an aphid. And what their eggs do when they hatch, they eat their way from the inside out of whatever insect they've been planted in. So a parasitoid, parasitoid wasp is a very helpful insect in our garden. Um, however, it is not discriminating who it plants its eggs in. It could be in a good guy too, but we need to let him do his job. On the bottom left is a minute pirate bug. And these are common predators in field crops and home gardens, and they're also known as the flower bug. And the adults and nymphs who look like small adults feed on the eggs and larvae of the bad guys like thrips, spider mites, psyllids, and white flies. In the bottom center is a lacewing. Primarily, you're going to see these guys in the early in the spring. And they also love to feed on aphids. Boy, those aphids have a lot of, of enemies, don't they? But we're glad because aphids are prolific. On the bottom right is the, my absolute favorite, the red-headed soldier beetle. And I think because it reminds me of fireflies in the Midwest. This guy is, um, his eggs and his larvae feed on beetles, grasshoppers, moths, and other insects. And at the same time, they pollinate the flowers. They're attracted to bright colored flowers like goldenrod. And it gets its name because it looks like a British show, British British soldier red coat. Next. All right, now here is a not so good butterfly, cabbage moth, it, a cabbage white butterfly. But you don't have to worry about him unless you're growing brassica plants like broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, and rutabaga. And you can see the damage he does there. He can eat lots of holes very quickly and destroy your vegetables. And his larva is that big green caterpillar there. Um, but if you don't have those vegetables in your garden, then don't worry about it. He can also help pollinate. Okay, next. Um, cutworms are in their caterpillar stage. They look like this brown, one to two inch long, sluggy looking cat caterpillar. And uh, then they will turn into, uh, and, then, and they are often called Miller moths once they turn into their moth stage. Uh, they're brown or gray, they're very plump, and their damage is, can be um, identified when you see a, a sign of seedling stems that have been clipped off close to the soil surface. They'll usually top the part, take the top part of the plant off and leave it untouched, and then they'll chew up the stems. They can eat garden vegetables and they like flowers too. And this, they're especially um, love to go after spring planting. So those are the ones that suffer the greatest damage from these cutworms. And they'll climb up the plant and they'll also feed on buds, shoots, and some foliage. And the leaf damage can look like what is shown here on this hosta. They will eat holes in the middle of the leaves. And you can tell that this is a cutworm and not a slug or snail, which also love hostas, because there's no slime trail. Okay. So how do you get rid of a cutworm? Well, you control the weeds and the plant debris around the base you plant to keep it away, keep it clean. Um, and this kind of helps reduce the habitat and food that is favored by them. You can vigilantly monitor them and hand pick them off at night with a flashlight, and um, that can help reduce the damage. And you should begin this process in early spring, and which will have the most benefit uh, to help protect your plants. Natural enemies of cutworms are ground beetles, spiders, wasps, parasitic um, nematodes, and birds. Okay, next one. We have stink bugs. Now, if you have a palm tree, such as apple, peach, pear, plum, cherry, or quince, 
you may see punctures in the fruit, as you can see here on the cherry and the apple. Um, they may look like there's dimpling or it could be discolored a little brown. You may have stink uh, bug damage on the fruit. So you should check your, your trees and plants weekly and remove the bugs by hand. Clean up old debris where the bugs hide in winter and you can use horticultural oil sprays on the trees or insecticidal soap sprays uh, to control the juvenile stink bugs. Next. Now, yuck. Here's one that we all know, the snails and the slugs, the slimy guys. These are the ones that are gonna leave that little slime trail across your patio, your leaves, all over the place. They are um, very destructive pests in the garden and in landscapes. Of course, um, they favor wet soil surfaces and are most active at night when it's cool and damp. Snails and slugs, they feed on a variety of living plants and on decaying plant matter. They create the irregular holes, the smooth edges on leaves and flowers. Uh, and they do this with their rasp-like tongues. These pests can be seriously damage, damaging on hostas, marigolds, basil, lettuce, strawberries, beans, cabbage, and many other vegetables, and even on succulents. So your goal is to eliminate the places that they can hide. So be sure to remove things like boards, excess debris, woody areas around tree trunks, leafy branches that are growing close to the ground, and keep your mulch and other debris away from the very base of, of your plants because these guys can climb up on that when they can you know, cross up and get up higher and climb up onto those plants from there. You should only water in the morning. And if you have plants in pots and these guys are starting to show up, put some copper flashing tape around the pot because they can't cross it. It cuts up their little tummies and they will die. So they're not, they're destructive. And so we have to be a little destructive with them. Okay, next. Now this is a spider mite. And Jane mentioned how environment issues can really um, set up the stage for some pretty bad insects. Spider mites are one of them. If you have a lot of dust, uh, they love dusty, dry conditions. And um, they will, will flock to those kind of plants. So they're really a problem out there in, in the uh, agricultural areas, but also around your home. Dust covered plants are their prime targets. And uh, when your plants or trees are stressed due to a lack of water and dust, they'll come. They will appear on the underside of leaves and cause damage by sucking, sucking out the cell contents. And a small number of mites usually isn't a reason for concern, but very high populations will show visible damage as stippling on your leaves and the leaves may become bronze colored. And more feeding will cause those same leaves to turn yellow, red and drop off and webs may appear. If it's now, if it's late in your growing season and you're pretty much done with your fruit and vegetable plant, the best way to manage this is to take the plant out um, because the treatment of dealing with spider mites is, is pretty harsh. And you don't need to do that if you just remove the plant. But if it's earlier in the season, they do have natural enemies such as lady bee beetles, lace wings and predatory mites, but insecticidal soaps and neem oil can also work. And but ideally you should go to the UC IPM website and look up this insect because there's a lot of things that can be used on them. But you need to be very careful how you use it. All right, the next one is scale. Now scales are sucking insects and they put their tiny straw-like mouth parts into the bark, fruit or leaves on trees and shrubs and other perennials. And, um, on the left here, you see armored scale, which is kind of flat and it's kind of hard or bumpy. And they do not secrete anything, but you're, you're gonna see this, this is how they're gonna look. 
But on the right, the brown soft scale, it's rounded, it secretes a sticky honeydew, mm -hmm. and um, it, it's just, uh, it's easy to find these things. You can see them easier on your stems and, and branches. Um, and the ants love them. So if you start seeing ants marching up your tree trunk, look at where they're going because they go up and they love to eat the sticky honeydew and they will protect the scale in order to keep their food source going. So that's when you need to get to work. And how do you get rid of them? Well, you can take your hand and just wipe down the branch and it will knock a lot of them off. Another thing is uh, local, well, natural enemies will attack the scale. And we already saw what happened to, um, well, how the, the uh, parasitoid wasps work. But here you'll also find lace wings, lady beetles again, the minute pirate bug, my, predatory mites. And if you have heavy infestations of this, you might want to then get out the uh, horticultural oil spray and do repeated applications of insecticidal soap to, to uh, kind of deal with the crawler, the tiny stage before they get like this and become adults with their little shells. Let's go to the next one. Now, I, we've talked about aphids already. They're soft, they're soft bodies. They come in green, black, brown. And I mentioned they secrete the honeydew and the ants will love it. And you can see in the middle picture here, the ant that is up there um, protecting his food source. But on the right, they have a lot of natural predators. The ladybugs, again, the lace wings, the parasitoid wasps. Um, and again, you can also just take a jet of water from your hose and hose them off. It knocks them on the ground, it breaks their little legs, and they can't get back up on the plant. Or another method you can do is uh, spray again with insecticidal soaps and uh, that will, or neem oil, and that will protect your, your plant because that suffocates the insects. But a word of caution, don't do that when there's ladybugs or the good guys around because they are also affected by those suffocating oils. Next. Now, these guys are fairly harmless, but they're plentiful. The earwig in the top left um, is one, though, that you could be concerned about if you are growing vegetables, flower, herbaceous flowering plants, sweet corn, or any soft fruits like strawberries and apricots. Um, if your, lawn, your yard is mostly lawn trees and woody ornamentals or native plants, then don't worry about the earwigs because they're also good guys. They um, will help uh, break down, uh, decompose things in the soil to help for better enriched soil for your plants. But so because they eat on this dead plant material um, and they'll also eat aphids. So um, they will avoid sunlight. So they're gonna come out at nighttime primarily or they're gonna be in dark places. So if you wanna get rid of them, roll up a damp newspaper and put it out at night because they're gonna crawl in there and then you can dispose of the newspaper in the morning. Now on the top right is a spittle bug. You don't have to worry about these guys. They just create this white foam that is, is harmless to your plant to kind of hide. So again, you can just use your, your garden hose to spray them off. The sow bug and the, the roly polies, which of course is our childhood and adult favorite because they're so fun to poke and then they roll into a little ball. Roly polies, um, are, they're good. Um, they feed primarily on decaying plant material and they're important decomposers of organic matter. Again, great for the soil. They will occasionally feed on seedlings, new roots, lower leaves, and fruits or vegetables that touch the soil. But if you can leave them alone, please do. Next. All right, these are the guys that are super bad that you must report if you find any of these in your garden. And this is only a small sampling of many invasive, very destructive insects. The Asian citrus psyllid attacks um, citrus trees, obviously, 
And they're very small, so it's very hard to identify this, except that you will see that white curly frass, which is their feces, basically, of the little larva. So if you start to see that, you need to call the hotline right away, and they will come and inspect your citrus trees. On the bottom left is an oak borer. This is a serious pest that attacks some of our mature oaks, oaks here in the valley. The larva drills into the bark, and they, if they keep doing that and feeding on the tree, they, they will, um, the tree will lose its vigor and eventually can die. Now, the Japanese beetle on the bottom right, he may be pretty with his shiny green back, but, and they are very common in the East Coast and Midwest. And they, of course, are starting to move west, but we don't want them here because as you can see, they feed on over 300 types of trees and ornamentals and your turf, your lawn. So please, I encourage you to go to that website, the IPM website, look up invasive and exotic pests, and you're gonna see a list of them and you can click on them and see what they do, who they are, and you'll know then they need to come out and inspect your, your plants. And I'm giving this back over to Jane now, thank you. Thank you, Lori. I learned a lot. Um, before we leave um, um, biotic, we'll still talk a little bit more about some biotic or living organisms that you will encounter. Um, I wanted to bring um, a talk a little bit about the disease triangle. I think it's a very important thing to keep in mind, especially as we go through the next area of the presentation. Um, Lori has mentioned this too, is about the various environments that you still have some of those insects um, and the various host plants that they, they um, attacked. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about that as well with some of the other um, living organisms. But this is really um, a key thing to keep in mind and that um, all three points of this disease triangle, the environment, the host plant, and the pathogen must be present for a disease to occur. And the host plant thinking about its overall health, its development stage, and its degree of susceptibility. Remember, we talked about knowing the plants in your garden or some of the plants in your garden susceptible to certain pathogens. And the environment, what is the environment that is needed for some of these pathogens? Weather, soil conditions, temperature, moisture, um, most infectious diseases develop best in temperatures that are warm and with high humidity. And then of course the host plant is that, um, I'm sorry, and of course the pathogen, what is it that is affecting them? So let's look at a few that we're encountering this season or some of you may have seen already. Um, fungus, fungus is a biotic issue and the single most important cause of plant disease. All plants are attacked by some type of disease causing fungus. So first let's look at peach leaf curl. Um, there's been a predominance of peach leaf curl this year. Um, the fungus is tephrina, and it causes this deformed, twisted leaves, as well as a fruit infection. Um, you see it on stone fruits, your nectarines and your peaches. Um, cool, wet weather, when the new leaves are beginning to unfurl, sets up the perfect environment for this pathogen and for the fungus to occur. If we have several days in a row of wet, cool weather, the tree is very susceptible. It rarely kills the tree. You wanna snip off the leaves when you see it um, as they appear and avoid overhead watering. During the dormant season, uh, you're gonna, you wanna prune your tree, of course, but that's when you would apply a fungicide such as a copper ammonium. Um, and then the thing, it, again, you have to apply it three times during that dormant season. And the, one of the little uh, ways to remember when to apply it is three holidays during that dormant season, and that's Thanksgiving, Christmas, and Valentine's Day. The, set, the one in the center is powdery mildew. Um, it's very common here in the valley. It's a powdery mildew fix many plants, and it's caused by several fungus, or fungi, I should say. Powdery mildew not only affects um, ornamental plants, but you also find it on fruit trees, vegetables, trees, and even weeds. You'll see the signs uh, occurring um, when they first start to appear because of these powdery white, uh, little white puffs. 
and the leaves then turn yellow and brown and they then fall off. The way to, if you have a plant that is susceptible to powdery mildew, you wanna make sure the plant is in sunny locations, has good air circulation around the plant. And you wanna avoid over fertilizing because a plant that is over fertilized and has lush foliage growth is actually uh, preferred um, and you're going to find the con more conditions of powdery mildew. The one on the right is a rose rust, that's a rose. And the rust is caused by various fungi. Um, and the rose rusts, uh, rusts in particular, uh, uh, per go after many types of hosts. And uh, you can see the spots uh, on the top of the leaf, is these yellow spots that occur. And then on the underside of the leaves is the orange spores. Um, and rust infects the host when the plant surfaces are wet and temperatures are mild, mostly during the spring and fall. And it's mostly spread by windborne spores. And it's also um, spread by infected other infected plants. And there's many species of rust and they are specific to their host. Rusts actually have minimal effect on the plant. They're very, it's not very attractive, but it has minimal effect on the plant, but some rusts, some rusts do affect the host and, and kill the host. This is another one where you wanna avoid overhead watering and trim the leaves as you see the rust occur and then collect the fallen, fallen leaves and dispose of them. You don't want the rust to get into the ground because then things can overwinter and you'll have it again next year. You wanna place the, the leaves in a garbage bag and do not compost. And that's the same with uh, the other fungus and viral ones that we'll be talking about. Um, you don't wanna put it in your compost and some of them you should actually avoid putting it in the city compost as well. You wanna cut off the shoots and the branches as they appear. The best thing is to plant rust resistant varieties. Um, you can use a, a preventative fungicide for rust, but again, like Laurie has mentioned too, some of the, um, the pesticides that you could use on these plants really don't justify the, because that it's not going to affect the health of the plant. The, the rust is not. Viruses. Viruses are submicroscopic pathogens that infect the cells. They actually uh, change the cell function. Some viruses are actually introduced to a plant. Um, for example, this intentional mosaic virus that was introduced to an abutilin. And the role of that was to create a different visual effect for um, a variegation to the leaves. But rust can, um, viruses can be transmitted by insects that are feeding on the plant that, um, via the sap or they can actually be spread mechanically. That's another way a virus can spread. And by your hand tools, <clears throat> excuse me. And once a plant is infected, it's infected for life. Um, it usually remains infected throughout the life of the plant. And this is another one where good sanitation of hand tools is important. That's going to help prevent the, um, viral infections. Viruses are slow growth. Um, they slow the growth of the plant and you do, normally don't see it until you start to see some um, flower uh, distortion, foliage distortion, um, and discoloring spots, streaks, or being stunted. There's no treatment or cure for the virus. Um, and the recommendation is that you replace the plants and of course, you would want to consider replacing the plant with a certified free, virus-free or virus-resistant variety. So as you can see, the past two, one, the past two topics, um, the virus and the fungus, you could see all three of the points of the triangle being in place for the plant to become infected. So now we're leaving biotic and talking about abiotic and we don't have, the amount of time to spend on abiotic issues because they're so numerous. There's hundreds of abiotics. And the point of us bringing this up is also that it's sometimes difficult to distinguish between a biotic issue and an abiotic issue. Um, but using your observational skills, knowing your plant, and putting on your detective hat and trying to do some diagnosis as to what's really causing the problem um, is, your, is how you want to proceed. Um, because our plants are so, or our gardens and our environment is so dynamic, things can change from day to day. And that's when abiotic issues occur. Um, 
sometimes, you know, an abiotic wind uh, situation could be we can have a, a great, a good rain, and that's good for the plants. But that can be the next day or the next couple of days, we could be followed by some hot, dry winds. And it's those um, symptoms, those environmental changes that can sometimes better affect the, the plant's growth or the health of the plant. So these abiotic issues, there's hundreds of possibilities con to consider. And it's not just sometimes a single event, one single event, but sometimes an interrelated event. For example, um, we could have a warm January and um, a warm January for a few days and all of a sudden we our plants start to react and we start to see some budding and um, some flowers. And then boom, that's that's followed by several days of cold, cold weather. Um, and so that's when you're going to see bud drop or limited growth um, changes in the flowers. Um, and so that's a abiotic situation that is affecting situations that um, the plant's behavior in your garden. Um, and those physical stresses that can stress the plant, for example, the, the long-term drought that we were experiencing, that was affecting the overall health of the plant and many of our plants and trees were very stressed. So what we're gonna do is look at some symptoms that um, we have to go, is this an abiotic issue or is this a biotic issue that is affecting my plant? So um, are these the same issues? So the plant, the leaf on the left here um, is has turned brown and is curling up from the tip. And the leaf on the right actually has some browning as well, but it's on the margins. So is this the same issue? Well, you need to ask yourself what's going on with the rest of the plant and what it has changed in my env environment and how long have I been noticing this? So the leaf on the left is actually sunburn and um, the sunburn can appear as a discoloration. Sometimes you'll see it start with a brown or, sh or reddish color on the leaf. Um, and then as it becomes more severe, it becomes what we refer to as necrotic is basically it's dying. That brown leaf edge is dead. And it's going to start from the edge and then move up through the through the rest of the leaf. Um, and actually, um, prolonged sunburn or sun damage can actually um, have some long term effects to your plant. And this this is when you kind of ask yourself, well, when did I notice this? Um, in a sunburn situation, you're normally going to see it happen rapidly. It can happen over you know the next morning. You go out and go, gee, my plant got sunburn. The plant on the right is a rose leaf. And basically what's happened to this plant is it didn't get enough water, water distress. And interestingly enough, um, the majority of the calls that come into our help desk are water distress related. So that's something to keep in mind is to stop and think about what, a, what a, the water situation uh, with this particular plant. And water distress can range in very numerous types of symptoms. Um, and it depends on the severity and the length of time that that plant went with um, without enough water. Too little water and the plant's just going to wilt, but if you have longer, then you're going to see this type of situation where the leaves are showing tip burn and um, death or necrosis across the margins of the leaf. Um, and it can be the whole plant then starts to die. It all depends, again, on the length of the system, the, the symptoms, how long that um, plant went um, and getting um, without water. It's also more chronic if um, it's not just accompanied by a lack of water, but hot, dry winds that have picked up and um, causing dehydration to the plant. Uh, last summer, uh, you know, here we were in our third year of a drought, and uh, we had, towards the end of summer, we had several days of hot, high temperatures accompanied by hot, dry winds. And my Japanese maple tree, not only did the leaves turn prematurely in color, but I had a, a large amount of leaf drop. And that was a chronic issue that was occurring with a number of trees. Just as we have water distress with not enough water, um, and as you can see, again, this is an example of um, early um, young shoots um, from not getting enough water. And that could just be a short um, period of time, not over a long period of time. And then on this side um, is an example where it's too much water. Um, and um, 
when you have too much water, that's going to affect the roots of the plant because the roots need to um, get oxygen. And if the plant is standing in, uh, been affected by excess water, standing um, water, it's going to affect the health of that tree. Uh, excess water over a period of time affects the roots because it the, reduces the oxygen and the aeration of that soil. Often the symptoms don't appear um, right away. They appear over a period of time. And you'll start to see slow growth, um, leaf size reduction, anemic or sick looking plant. And this can also be observed sometime with leaf drop and then twig dieback. Here's another situation. Um, is, are these the same thing? Are all of these plants affected by the same thing? Well, it's not a bi biotic issue. It's not an insect or a fungus. It's a um, abiotic issue. And on the left here is a sycamore. And you see the leaves are cupped and curled. In the middle, again, this plant has some tip burn and also um, the leaf is turning brown. Over here, these leaves are cupped and turning under and they're a bit yellow. So what's going on in each of these situations? Um, on the left with the sycamore tree, um, that actually has been exposed to a chemical, an herbicide. It was inadvertently sprayed on, in the direction of the tree. And that's referred to as phytotoxicity and it's a chemical damage. And the symptoms, this, um, that are displayed actually depend on the chemical that was used. Um, so it depends what the, the plant was exposed to, but normally you're going to see signs of leaf spot, <clears throat> excuse me, browning, stunted growth, and eventually possibly death. And this middle photo, and this is frost. It could be injured in just an overnight frost or several days of frost, but it's the new tips on the plant um, young new shoots and leaves are the most sensitive. And frost tender plants can be injured just, as I said, by an overnight freeze, um, or even if it is not normally um, affected by cold. If we have several days of uh, frost or below normal temperatures of nights very hitting the, the freezing, you can see plants that not normally be affected by cold being affected. So this is an example of um, a plant being affected by frost in young shoots. And this plant over here on the right is a citrus and um, it's showing the, the symptoms of a nutritional deficiency. And um, it most likely is uh, potassium, um, but um, a potassium deficiency. And normally what you're gonna see is some of these are seasonal as well. This particular one is seasonal. So again, knowing your plants and knowing what type of nutrition it needs is very important. And one more before we leave some of the um, look-alike symptoms. On the left, you kind of wonder, what the heck happened to this trunk of this tree? Did a squirrel attack it somehow, or, or is this a disease? Well, actually what this is, is um, mechanical um, injury to the tree, um, a weed whacker. Um, and that was a weed whacker getting too close. Sometimes you see somebody helping out in the garden and they're helping to weed whack and they get the weed whacker too close to the tree. And this one on the right is an example of excessive staking. And that's going to affect the growth and development of the tree. Uh, a tree needs to be able to develop its strength by moving back and forth. Staking is okay, but if you're restricting the, the, the ability for that tree to grow its structure and strength, um, it's going to be severely damaged. Um, once trees like this have been exposed to injuries, they're going to be more prone to damage such as the wood boring beetles or a bark beetle or even fungus. So, uh, we could not go into great detail um, with all of the things that you might encounter in your garden as far as causing you to wonder what's going on, what's bugging my garden. But the goal tonight was to try to encourage you not to jump to conclusions, uh, to consider many possibilities, uh, be observant and be curious. As we mentioned earlier, your plants are pretty dynamic um, and it, the needs and the requirements of the leaves I mean, of the needs and the requirements of your garden change um, seasonally and in some cases day to day. 
Um, it's, you know, one of the things becoming a master gardener, people sometimes ask you, well, what's, what's wrong with my plant? What's this doing? And, and we have a tendency to say back to folks, well, it depends. So keep that in mind, know what it could be, depend on. Um, before we leave um, tonight too, we wanna to talk a little bit more about integrated pest management. Um, you hear us mention that a lot, IPM. And um, basically the way to think about integrated pest management is um, it's a combination of tools and resources. Um, so tonight we gave you several examples how you could incorporate um, integrated pest management by thinking about disease resistant varieties, um, when um, good cultural practices are really important in your garden, for example, sanitizing your tools and sanitizing um, your containers and disposing of diseased plants in the garbage, and also just modifying your garden environment for the right plant in the right place. Use informed water use. Um, don't overwater or underwater. We talked about how the majority of the calls that we get at the uh, help desk are deal with water distress. Um, avoid using pesticides and herbicides and only when actually needed. Remember that most insects are not harmful and they're not going to destroy your plants. You need to learn, kind of learn to tolerate some of the seasonality of our biotic and abiotic issues. Otherwise, we could overuse chemicals and, and affect our environment. The goal, as we're trying to show you here in this um, uh, slide, is to encourage biodiversity. Uh, use a wide variety of plants in your garden. Um, encourage birds and insects and other living species. Um, there's, as Lori had mentioned, some of the, the insects that you might run into are decomposers and some are pest controllers. Um, and some of our little critters that visit our yards as well as lizards and birds are going to help you. The goal is an interconnected web of life. And then here's some reminders about pest use of pesticides and herbicides. Um, only use when non-chemical controls are ineffective. Use pesticides and herbicides in combination with some of the items that we mentioned in combination with IPM. Choose the least toxic um, pesticide or herbicide that, talks, that targets your specific pest and follow the product labels carefully and follow all instructions properly. And don't go into your garage or shed and pull out outdated or um, old products because not only could it no longer be effective, that the law could have changed and that particular product may no longer be um, uh, used, should be being used. Store the products tightly, capped in, locked, in a locked cabinet and out of reach of children and pets. And disposal of pesticides is only allowable through household hazardous waste collection sites. And there's the number that 1-800-253-2687 for a site near you. And um, remember what you use in your garden affects our streams and rivers. And we said several times tonight, Call the help desk. <laughs> so here's the information you might need to know for the help desk. We're open Monday through Friday, Monday and Friday, not Monday through Friday, from 10 a.m. to 1. Um, for best results, um, the, the best is to send a photo of the plant that you are, are questioning or the weed, the insect, or whatever it is you may be questioning. Um, and please leave a phone message if you call and describe the problem. We'll need your, your phone number and email because more than likely we're going to have to get back to you and ask you questions about what's the environment um, in which you're observing that plant or that weed or that um, insect. And so um, here's our references that will be available on the website once we post our, our presentation. And uh, normally, we're well, we are gonna open it up for questions, but what I'm going to show you next is the um, upcoming events so that we can answer your questions while you're seeing what other events the Master Gardeners will be putting on in the month of July and early August. And now we're opening it up for questions. Okay, Jane and Lori, um, we, we did have one question that it looks like Yvonne has already addressed in chat. And, and that question was, do viruses continue living in the soil after an infested, infected 
plant has been removed? And she says, usually not. But let's see if we have any other questions. If you do have a question for our master gardeners, you can type them right into chat. Huh? Doesn't look like we have any more questions. No more questions? No. We <laughs> Um, oh, I have I have a question actually. When you guys were talking about uh, slugs and snails, mm -hmm. Lori mentioned using copper tape um, as a barrier. How safe is it to use um, sn uh, sl slug and snail bait? Do you know? Um, from what I've read about like sluggo, it's it's okay. It's it's safe to use. Another method though is diatomaceous earth, which is a white powdery substance, and you can sprinkle that around the plant or on the ground, and that will prevent them also from crossing that as a barrier uh, to get to your plant. And okay, that was actually, yeah. Um, I want to mention that. Um, the one one type of bait that we want to avoid is metaldehyde, which is the old style um, baits. Those are quite uh, dangerous for pets. And uh -huh. the iron phosphates are the ones like Sluggo that have a different formulation and they are much safer for pets and kids. So you want to try to stay away from the metaldehyde type of baits. Great. Another good reason not to use older outdated products. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we did have um, another question that just came in. And, and the question is, uh, for aphids, how, how often should we hose the plants off? Whenever you see a lot of them. <laughs> uh, but if you see ladybugs and other good guys around ready to eat them, just give them a chance to have that be their meal. But if you continue to see the aphids there, then I would just hose them off if you've got quite a bit of them as was shown in that picture it was a lot if you've got a few I wouldn't worry about it the predators will get it okay great mm -hmm. looks like that may be it on questions Jane do you want to go to the next slide this is just our web address napamg.ucanr dot edu and if you go to that website you're going to be able to find everything we've got this is a close-up of the page and what we really wanted to bring your attention to is that if you scroll about halfway down the page you're going to see something that says past programs and events and if you click on that you'll be able to see a copy of this presentation and all of our other presentations that you can watch again at your leisure. And you'll also be able to find out about our upcoming events and you'll be able to register for them. And you'll find links um, to our help desk and the UCIPM sites that we've talked about tonight. So I think that's it. Is that the last slide, Jane? I think it yes, is. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's see if we have any other questions. No, everybody's just saying how wonderful you two are. Oh, thank you. And thanks for joining it tonight. Thank oh, you. Oh, and next week, our uh, next month is um, Smart Landscaping with Ornamental plant, ornamental Vines. Okay. All right. See you have next month.